Good morning, everyone. You can go ahead and have a seat. I am really glad that you chose to be here on this cold, wintry, wet day because I believe that in your choosing to be here, God will bless you and that this will be a great experience because you're going to hear God's word taught. You're hopefully going to receive it and it's going to change your life and the experience of worshiping and connecting with others. Those things build up to create a very blessed life, a very good life. Last week, Pastor Brian wrapped up our series called I Believe. He did an excellent job of teaching our core values, some of those main things that we believe that we as a church family have to be united on. Those were core beliefs. There's no question about what we believe about those things and that we will hold those to be true in our lives, in the world. So if you missed any one of the last six sermons, I encourage you, go to our YouTube channel, Chico Community Church. That's all you gotta type it in, it'll pop up for you. If you missed one of those, listen to it because you need to know what was taught. That was our core beliefs. Today I'm starting a new series, focusing on teaching you strategies. Strategies for stability. Strategies for how to do life the Jesus way. Strategies for, for how to handle the challenges that you face. Strategies for how to, how to handle the situations that you are in and you're wondering, what should I do? And you should be able to reflect back on what you're taught today and in the coming weeks to be, oh, this is what the Bible says. This is how Jesus would respond in this situation. And so I encourage you, take notes and take it home. Work it into your life. The strategies I will be giving you are strategies that will make some aspect of your life better. Strategies, strategies that will help you move forward in life. So we're gonna be discussing a variety of things about how to solve some of life's struggles in this series. Now in life, we all experience struggles. No one is free of that. We all experience it. And one of the things you face in life is the struggle of, of feeling inadequate. We, we all have it. It's, it's, it's when you look at your life and you think, oh, I don't have what it takes. I don't have what it takes to be a parent. I don't have what it takes to be a believer. I don't have what it takes to be a leader. I don't have what it takes to face what's in front of me right now. I just simply don't have what it takes. Have you ever felt that way? I have. I have struggled with these types of things. We all have these moments of, of insecurity, moments of doubt, moments of feeling inadequate. A lot of times we face circumstances and, and in those circumstances we get confused. And we end up out of our confusion living a fear-based life rather than a faith-based life. And when we're living in fear, life does not go as well as it would if we lived by faith. Because by living in fear, we're cutting off the power source of God to work and to act in our lives. When we do that, when we make choices out of that, it puts us into a place where there are limits on us. And God's not able to do what he wants to do because we're acting out of fear rather than faith. I want you to look at this verse with me on your outline. Ephesians 1.19. He says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. Now, this is my prayer for you today. In fact, I want to pray this for you, for us right now. So let's pray. Father, I pray that the eyes of our hearts would be opened. I pray that we would be enlightened this morning. I pray that we would experience your great power in our lives and that coming out of that, we would move forward differently. I pray that we would honor you and I pray that you would bless us as we follow you faithfully. I pray that in the name of your son, Jesus, amen. God has this amazing power and he wants to share it with us. 
He wants to help us to do life. He has this great power, and the, the Bible says that he wants to use that to work in our lives because we need that. Because we have these feelings of, I don't have what it takes. And what God wants to do is he wants to express to you, when you have that thought, I don't have what it takes, God wants to express to you that, hey, I have what it takes. I could help you. I could move you forward. If you would look to me, trust me, depend on me. See, every day we are dealing with situations of life and Jesus is the God of everyday life. He knows what we deal with. He knows what we struggle with. He knows what we face. And he wants to help us in the midst of our everyday living because that's who he is. That's what he does. And yet we struggle. We face these circumstances. And when those struggles happen, we react or we respond. We need to learn to respond rather than react in those situations. Now, we can respond in one of two ways. We could get mad, and all that does is it deepens our struggle, and it deepens the recovery time that it takes for me to, to get out of that and to move forward. You see, when we respond the way God wants us to, we experience God's presence, and then we can experience God's power in our life to help us overcome what we're struggling with. So I picked three circumstances that I think we could all relate to because I think we all deal with these circumstances. And I'm also gonna give you the response that I believe God wants us to make in the midst of these circumstances. The three circumstances are frustrating weakness, we all have it, unreasonable people, we all have to deal with them, and impossible problems. So how should we respond to these three challenging situations of life? The first one, we respond to frustrating weakness with dependence on God. And we all have weaknesses. We don't readily admit them, but, but we have them. In 2 Corinthians 12, the apostle Paul, he's talking about the weaknesses in his own life. And he said, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. For when I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak and I acknowledge my weakness and I acknowledge God and God's power, then God has the moment of acting on his power in the midst of my weakness. So what is a frustrating weakness? A frustrating weakness is a limitation that you have, either real or perceived. You lack something that you want or you need. And God says, my power is made perfect in weakness. When I face a weakness in my life, it's an invite. I'm getting an invitation to respond to God in a way that, that can build in me a new sense of confidence in God. When I respond to God with dependence on him, man, that is, a, that is a wonderful moment. It really is. When I am feeling in my weakness and I am struggling with my weakness, if I let that begin to consume me, then, then I, you know, it's like I'm, I'm, I'm just closing in and I'm backing up and I'm withdrawing. But when I acknowledge my weakness with my dependence upon God, then I can feel God's spirit filling me, giving me power, giving me confidence, and I'm able to do something that I am not able to do on my own. A good question to ask yourself is what am I attempting in my life that I cannot pull off on my own strength? You might have something like that. Dependence helps us understand God's strength in our lives. So how do you see God's power in your weakness? You respond in dependence on him. And then he does these amazing things in your life. He enables you to do something that you could not do. 
Years ago, when I started Chico Community Church, I had, and I had all the way up to this moment of my life, an intense fear of getting front of, in front of anybody in public. I had this intense fear of speaking. It was so intense that I just could not do it. And yet, for one thing, I had to do it to get out of college. <laughs> but I was so just petrified with fear. I remember the first speech that I gave. Man, I gave it, I sat down, and the professor said, Gary, I'd like to talk to you after class. And he said, class, I want you to know that was a classic 3S speech. Shut up, what, stand up, sit down. No, stand up, shut up, and sit down. That's what I did, and I had this fear. But he was a gracious man. He told me, he said, Gary, I, I know what you're feeling. You have this intense fear, and it is overcoming in your life. But if you will make me a promise, I'll make you a promise. I can tell you're, you're ready to bolt, which was true. I had take spe taken speech before, and I bolted every time. Kind of silly. I'd sign up for the class. I'd go to the class. I'd go for weeks until I had to get up and give a speech. And then I wouldn't show. I would just ghost to the class. So he told me, he said, Gary, if you will come and just make an honest attempt at what I'm asking, I will pass you. It doesn't matter how good you do, how bad you do. If I can tell you're making an attempt, I will pass you. So you fast forward to, to God wants me to come and start a church. And I say, I can't do it. To the people that were saying, Gary, we think you should do this. I'm saying, I can't do it. I can do everything else. I would love to do this and this and this, but I can't speak. Yet God spoke to me these words. Gary, you have a weakness. God has a strength and he wants to make his power evident in my weakness. So I said, okay. And those of you that were with me in the very beginning days, we had a, we had a wooden podium, something like this. I still have it. I used to grip that thing so tight. It has my handprints on this position. And yet God gave me grace. God blessed what I did and how I did it. And I moved forward and I eventually got to the place where I could put myself aside and trust God to come through and do what he wanted to do in my life. And he does. See, some people come to God or they approach life from a self-oriented stance. It's about self. It's only about what they can do and what they want to do. And in doing that, they, they limit what God can accomplish. That's what I had done my entire life. God can't do much with that person. He can't do much with the person who is not going to depend on him. But when someone comes to Christ and says, I need you, I am totally depending on you. That's what God's looking for. Because then God could step up and do something amazing and all of the people are amazed by it. I am still amazed by it and I love it. I love what God does with me and through me. So with each one of these, I want to give you a practical place to start. See, depending upon God is this huge, huge thing. So where do you start? For me, a starting place is meaningful worship because it's in meaningful worship where I connect with God and I acknowledge who God is. And so we sing songs about who God is, what God does. That's so that we could get our focus off of ourselves off of our situations and onto the God who really is amazing. He is real and he is amazing. And in meaningful worship, which, which is something that we want for you to experience every Sunday, you get to, to touch God. God gets to touch you and you feel the difference of that worship experience. Meaningful worship, it reveals and it reminds you 
who God is and what God could do. Psalm 63, two says, I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. That's what meaningful worship does for you. You realize who God is. And it's sort of, as, as, as you're worshiping God, God is flowing through the moment and he's flowing through your life and he's pushing out those fears and those insecurities. And you feel a sense of being lifted mentally, emotionally, because you're connecting with the God of the heavens. And he blesses you with his presence and with his power. So we have to deal with our own weaknesses. We do that with dependence on God. Another area we have to deal with is people. People, people, people. How do you deal with people, especially the unreasonable ones? The hard to deal with ones. We respond to unreasonable people with patience. So what does an unreasonable person look like? Don't look to that person next to you. <laughs> Don't be pointing fingers. So that, oh, that's what that unreasonable person looks like. The unreasonable person, they, they criticize more than they encourage. They're defensive. It, it seems that they like conflict. It seems that they like arguments. They tend to major on minors. They keep you focusing, they keep you from focusing on what's really important. They're selfish. They're demanding. They want things done their way. Do you know anybody like that? Go ahead. Yes. I know some unreasonable people. Sometimes you work with them. Sometimes you live with them. <laughs> Sometimes you bump into them at the store. So how should you respond to unreasonable people? With patience. We need to be patient. Again and again in the Bible, the Bible encourages us to be patient with people. In Ephesians 4, 2, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Be patient, making allowance for each other. So <clears throat> on Thursday, right before this storm hit, and if you don't know it already, the day before a storm is windy. That's what happens. I'm driving to Sacramento. It is windy. The, st it, the wind is blowing so hard. I could feel it on my vehicle. I'm driving down the road and all of a sudden, the wind is so big. Right in front of me is a delivery truck. I used to drive a delivery truck. I know how hard it is to handle a delivery truck in the high winds. I've seen other delivery trucks blow over and fall on their sides. So here I am behind this delivery truck. Okay, so for one, I am not passing this truck. If I were going to pass that truck, I would make allowance for it. I would go as far over to the left as I could because I don't want them to bump into me in the midst of the storm. So we need to realize a lot of the people that we're relating to in life, they are in the midst of their own storm. Something is going on in their life. We need to make allowance for them so that we don't bump into each other and cause a crash relationally. We do that with patience. In our patience, in our love, we just give them some space. We make allowance for them. That's what this verse is saying to us. This verse is saying, make allowances for people. Realize that they're already weaving in life. Realize they're already, maybe they're facing a storm in life. So where do I start? How can I develop this attitude in my life? The starting place is to get a grip on God's love for you. Because that's how you show them patience. That's how you give them an allowance. Because of your love. So you need God's love in your life. Ephesians 3, 17 and 18 says, and I, I pray that you may have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep 
is the love of Christ. He's praying that you grasp it, that you get a grip on it, and that you don't let it go. It is one thing to hear about how great God's love is for you. It's a totally different thing to actually grasp it and experience it in your life, to hold on to you, hold on to it. Now, I love going to some beautiful place. You know, the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, the Canadian Rockies. But on the other side of that, have you ever gotten a postcard from somebody from one of those places? And the postcard is really beautiful, but it is nothing compared to the grandeur of what is really there. You could look at that postcard of the Canadian Rockies, you know, of Lake Louise or of Banff, of all these places, and be like, wow, that's beautiful. But if you were to go there and look at it, you'd be, wow, that has just taken my breath away. It is completely different when you see something on a three by five postcard compared to seeing it in the beauty of how God created it, in its majesty, in its, in its grandeur, because in that moment, you see it, you feel it, and you can grasp how beautiful it really is. So it's very different to simply see a picture of something than it is to actually see it in real life. God does not want for you just to hear about how great his love is for you. He wants you to experience it, to feel it, to know it, to grasp it so that it could change your outcome, so that it could change your outlook, so that it will change your life. Paul says, I pray for you. I'm praying for you that you would get it, that you would understand it, that you would grasp it because you need to grasp it for yourself. Once you grasp God's love for you, you will have a new ability to love other people. Once you grasp God's love for you, you will have a deeper ability to love people more deeply. These unreasonable people need us to love them. We love them with patience. We need to be more patient with them. Third area that we have to deal with is problems. How do you deal with problems that seem impossible? We respond to impossible problems with faith. He encourages us to, to learn, to learn to respond to impro impossible problems with faith. Because a lot of times, you know, we're thinking if, if God is trying to help me be become more confident, why does he put me in situations where I don't feel like I could succeed? You know, why is that? I'll tell you why. He's not trying to build your self-confidence. He is trying to build your God-confidence. You do not need confidence in yourself. When you focus on yourself, you're going down the wrong path and you're going in the opposite direction of where God is. That is self-confidence. What you need is God confidence, radically different. There is no power in self-confidence. There is all power in God confidence. He wants to build your confidence in him. That's what he wants. You know, it's interesting to learn about some of the experiences of, of the disciples. They were an interesting bunch. They had a lot of problems. They had a lot of challenges. They made a lot of mistakes. And basically when I read about them or one of their experiences, I think, wow, that's just like me. I would probably do that. I, I would probably say that. I shouldn't, but I probably would. One time in the middle of the, of the Sea of Galilee, this huge storm came up. Jesus is asleep on the boat. Now, now you gotta understand, some of these men were fishermen. They knew what it meant to be out in a storm, and yet they're acknowledging this storm is big, and they're afraid. 
They're scared. Jesus is sleeping. They finally get him to wake up. He wakes up. Wow, we got a big storm going on. Peace, be still. And the, the storm calms. In the midst of their struggle, the storm calms because Jesus told it to calm. And then he looks at his disciples and he says, you timid disciples, you men of little faith. I think the reason Jesus was upset was because they were focusing on the storm around them rather than focusing on Jesus who was with them, who they knew by now, or they should know by now, he could calm the storm. And yet we do the same thing. We focus on our problem rather than focusing on Jesus who is with us. The fishermen cowered from the storm in fear instead of calling on Jesus in faith. The disciples were in what seemed to them to be an impossible problem, a problem they could not handle. You know, that's not what upset Jesus. What bothered Jesus was that they didn't turn to him for help. You have to know it is okay to admit you need help when you need it. That's actually what God wants from us. He wants us to admit that we need help and to look to him as the one who could help us. The Bible says in Luke 137, God can do anything. Anytime you have another problem, let me rephrase that. When you have another problem, you need to remember this. God could do anything. In Luke 18, 27, God could do things that are not possible for people to do. Of course he can. He is God. All powerful. All knowing. Have you discovered that God can do anything in a personal way in your life? Have you set aside your fear and focused on faith long enough that that window opens up and you see that God is amazing and he wants to do amazing things in your life? But if you focus on your problem, if you focus on your fear, you don't see it. You're just leaving these windows closed. God wants us to look to him. After the storm, Jesus said to his disciples, why were you so fearful? Don't you even yet have confidence in me? For some of you, that's the message God wants you to hear this morning. Don't you even yet have confidence in me? Jesus is the God who could calm your storm. No matter what storm of life you are facing, and there are so many of them, Jesus is the one that could calm your storm. He's the one, but you have to look to him. You have to trust him to do it. I, I believe that God has shown you enough already that you would have confidence in him. So you need to make the choice to have confidence in him. The disciples had seen him do so many things. They, they should have had full confidence. And yet a storm came up, they cowered in fear. We need to respond in faith and not in fear. Impossible problems are an invitation to have confidence, not confidence in yourself, not self-confidence, God confidence. The starting place for dealing with impossible problems is acknowledging God's power. God, you are the powerful one. Help me through this storm that I'm facing right now. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing is too hard for you. We need to acknowledge that when we face a problem. God, you have made the heavens and the earth. 
nothing is too hard for you. Would you please help me in this moment? In the midst of your moments of frustrating weakness, of unreasonable people, of impossible problems, you are being given an invitation. And it is God who is inviting you. He's inviting you to depend on me. Be patient like me. Have faith in me. As you face frustrating weaknesses, it's an invitation to respond with dependence on God. As you face unreasonable people, it's an invitation to respond with patience. As you face impossible problems, it's an invitation to respond in faith. These, these are strategies for stability. Strategies that make some aspect of your life better. A way of doing something that, that solves a challenge that you're facing. A way of doing something that changes your life in a significant way. I've given you three strategies this morning. Three strategies to face three of the challenges that you face. With frustrating weakness, you go with dependence on God. With unreasonable people, you go with patience like God. With impossible problems, you go with faith in God. Leave this last verse with me, Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory. We need to, above all else, acknowledge God. Depend on God. Work at, at building our character to be like God and to have our faith in him. It's not about self-confidence. It is about God confidence. We need to put our confidence in God. Let's pray. Father, I am so grateful for who you are, for how you work in our lives, for all of these amazing things that you do. I pray that we would put our trust in you, that we would trust you fully with our lives being dependent on you, being patient like you, and not living a fear-based life, but living a faith-based life. I pray that we would do that as we follow your son, Jesus. I pray that in his name, amen.